I've never owned an electric vehicle yet, but for the past three weeks, I've been driving around this Polestar 2. I've driven a couple of thousand kilometers on Australia's busiest highway. I've driven to rural towns and I've changed up public charges in the city and Canberra, like I'm doing now. I've experienced the delights of all of these kinds of public charges. I'm gonna say I was hesitant about making this video because I've seen the reaction that the EV community gives to pieces like this from EV newbies like myself who write about their experiences. So let's get the objections out of the way up front. Yes, I chose to do long road trips, often in areas with sketchy charger availability, and I didn't even do it in a Tesla. Yes, I'm aware that you smug long time EV owners could have done it with much less trouble than I've had, but I'm gonna tell you about my struggles anyway, because I will only have the chance to see these issues with beginner eyes this one time. And a beginner's experience is important information for those who are working to take EVs from early adopters only to mainstream. I am an EV enthusiast for sure, and I'm happy to go to considerable effort to learn how to make these kinds of trips work in an EV. And spoiler alert, a certain level of enthusiasm for EVs is currently necessary to make road trips in Australia in an EV tolerable. In this video, I'm going to share my experiences during the 3,000 odd kilometers that I drove in this car. My itinerary was Sydney to Canberra, Canberra to Melbourne for a clean energy conference, then Melbourne to Canberra via Wagga Wagga, where I stopped to film a video on perovskite solar cells, um, then Canberra to Sydney and back the next day. That was a trip to see Niels Fram at the Sydney Opera House, Canberra to Kosciuszko National Park for a couple of days of cross-country skiing, and the odd trip around town in Canberra to visit clients for work. I'm going to talk about what worked well, what was a real struggle, and how long the mythical range anxiety lasted for me. I'm Rosie Barnes. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. I've been keen on electric vehicles for ages and wanting to buy one for years, but a few things have stopped me. First, the last time I bought a car was back in 2016 and it was a 2007 Phobia. It was surprisingly expensive, about the equivalent of 13,000 Australian dollars. That's because I bought it in Denmark and they have very high taxes on cars there. But even so, there were definitely no EVs remotely in that price range back then. I have since moved back to Australia and I would really like to get an EV now. In fact, I have been delaying buying any kind of car since I moved home over a year ago as I've been suffering from analysis paralysis, trying my hardest to make the case for an EV being our next car. But it's tricky because I don't think my partner and I are your typical car owners. We both ride our bikes to work. In fact, I mostly work from home, so I don't commute anywhere most days. I would estimate at least 90% of our kilometers driven come from long trips. We drive to go to the coast to go surfing, to the mountains to go skiing or mountain biking. So that's why I've been stuck for the past 18 months. I'm not sure what EV to get or even whether it suits our lifestyle at all. The main sticking point has been to try to figure out what range we need in a car. There is a huge difference in cost between a short range EV like a Mini Cooper with 233 kilometer range and a Tesla Model S with 652 kilometer range. So I was absolutely thrilled when I asked Polestar if I could borrow one of their cars to do some work related road trips and they said yes. They loaned me a Polestar 2 in the long range dual motor option. It's got a 78 kilowatt hour battery and a stated 487 kilometer range. It also has all the options that I wouldn't have thought I needed in a car but I now find I do. I'll just give a quick run down on the trips I did in the Polestar and then talk through some of the more <clears throat> interesting events. I drove about 3,000 kilometers in total. I made 16 charging stops at public charges to charge about 600 kilowatt hours, which I paid $284 for. Of those 15 charging stops, six went smoothly and nine had problems or hassles. And three of those hassles were like major hassles. I picked the car up in Sydney on a Saturday morning. I put my destination in the computer. And as the battery wasn't full, I found I didn't have enough charge to get all the way to Canberra. The car suggested I stop at Mittagong and bonus, that's an NRMA 50 kilowatt charger and those are currently free to use. When I got to the charger, I was third in line and I waited about an hour before I could plug in. I had a great chat with a couple of other drivers there. I got a cup of tea at the nearby club and then my charge up to 80% took about an hour. I could have actually only charged a 60% and had more than enough range to get home. But at that stage, I didn't trust the computer's estimate, so I overdid it a bit. By the time I was done, the queue was up to four people and probably at least two and a half hours wait to start charging. In hindsight, this was pretty selfish and annoying behavior on my part to charge so high while there were people waiting. And several others had come and seen the queue and decided to continue to the ultra rapid charger at Goulburn. So first lesson, free chargers have big queues and if you don't want to wait, you'd better come at a weird time, not midday on a Saturday. My next big trip was Canberra to Melbourne. Now I had naively assumed that on a 660 kilometer trip in a car with 487 kilometer range, I would need one charging stop. 
wrong for a few reasons. First, the 487 kilometer range is based on WLTP, Worldwide Harmonized Light Vehicle Test Procedure, certified range, which measures the range of a car traveling at an average speed of 30 miles per hour in summer temperatures. On the highway, the car gets less, mostly due to aerodynamic drag being much larger at highway speeds. The second issue is you generally don't drive from 100% battery charge all the way down to zero. I only left with enough to get me to the first 350 kilowatt charger at Gundagai because I couldn't be bothered to wait for the full charge at the 50 kilowatt charger I used in Canberra the night before I left. I didn't charge at home because our single car garage is full of sports gear and I'm too lazy to move it all out of the way. And another factor is that there are only a few ultra rapid chargers on my route, a hundred or more kilometers apart. So you don't get a choice to drive down to say 5% charge before stopping. You'll probably stop at the first charger after you reach about 25% charge. And then there are some charging characteristics that mean that charging slows way down from about 80% on. So it would take ages if you wanted to fully charge each time. And in this way, I found instead of one charging stop, like I'd naively expected, it would be three. In this trip, it was Gundagai, Banawatha, and Euroa. En route to Gundagai, I was stressed. I'd planned to get there with 20% battery left, but was the car computer's battery estimate telling me lies? I was anxious, but as I went along and the Polestar computer's range prediction didn't move that much, I relaxed and realized that the range anxiety had basically already left me after only maybe 500 kilometers of total driving. But it was replaced by something that never left me after 3,000 kilometers of driving, charger anxiety. What happens if the Gundagai chargers were all broken? or if the app didn't work. 20% charge was not going to get me as far as the next ultra rapid charger. So if that one didn't work out, then all my plans for the day were off. It turned out fine. I was the only one at the charger at Gundagai and it worked great. Same at Banawatha and at Euroa, there were some annoying things happening with the app, but it didn't add much extra time. The trip to Melbourne took about eight and a half hours, which is one to two hours more than in a petrol car, depending on whether I would have stopped for lunch and coffees anyway. I made it to my conference at about the time I planned to, and I felt the satisfaction that only an EV owner nose coursing through my veins. Another word for that feeling is smug and it felt great. I had just done an EV road trip and even on my first try, it was a great smooth experience. Twitter was right. All those journalists who wrote about EV road trips in the Wall Street Journal and the like were clearly morons and I'm not. I'm one of you now, smug Twitter EV community. Yeah, you can probably tell that didn't last. A couple of days later, I returned to the public car park to get the Polestar. I hadn't charged it since I arrived in Melbourne. I chose a car park based on proximity to my accommodation, not based on whether it had charging or not. And now I had to find a charger before I could even get out of Melbourne to start my trip back to Canberra via Wagga Wagga. This was the worst leg of my EV road tripping. I won't go through all the details, but it involved five chargers. Three of them were problematic and two of them were very problematic. At the first stop in Melbourne, I had an issue with the charging app not talking to the chargers that took about half an hour to eventually sort out with Chargefox's customer service. At other stops, there were broken chargers and places where all the chargers were in use so I had to wait. Then there was the issue of charging speed. Although I was at 350 kilowatt charges, I was only getting about 60 to 100 kilowatts. So this is my second big newbie lesson. An ultra rapid charger doesn't mean that you'll get ultra rapid charging. The first constraint is that most EVs can't accept a full 350 kilowatts. The Polestar can use 150 kilowatts maximum. Some other EVs can go as high as 350 kilowatts, but only at certain levels of charge. Every EV has its own unique charge curve and the charge rate depends on where you are between zero to 100 state of charge. But the biggest problem that I had on this leg of my road trip was primarily a problem of user error, I will admit. My last charge stop before Wagga, I charged to a little over 80% because I needed to get to Wagga and then to Gundagai before I would see another fast charger, an ultra rapid charger. And 83% would have got me there with 10% remaining. I should probably have given myself a bit more of a buffer, but I was now running late for my appointment due to the delays from the first couple of charges, so I didn't. On the way to Wagga, I missed the suggested turn off because it came earlier than I was expecting. According to the Polestar trip computer, I should have turned off to do the last 100-ish kilometers on B roads but I stayed longer on the highway. There was no difference in the ETA between the original route compared to the highway route, but as soon as the computer rerouted, I lost 5% expected destination charge due to more distance at a higher speed than the route I should have taken. If I wasn't running late, I might have slowed down at this point to save battery, but by now I was running quite late and at risk of missing out on my YouTube filming appointment altogether. I did make it to Wagga in business hours and I had a very short tour of Great Cells Research and Pilot Perovskite Solar Cell Manufacturing Facility before they closed up that day. 
So that was a bit disappointing to not get more time there, but not as disappointing as when I realized that I was now estimated to get to the Gundagai charger with 4% battery remaining. And as the temperature was rapidly dropping below zero, I worried that it would actually be less than that. I didn't want to get stuck at night in the middle of absolutely nowhere between Wagga Wagga and Gundagai. Instead, I detoured to the only non-Tesla charger in Wagga, another one of those free NRMA 50 kilowatt chargers. By now, we know that free chargers mean queues, and when I got there, I found a Tesla charging over 80 with no driver in sight. I debated the ethics of disconnecting it since I think normal etiquette dictates that charging above 80% on a public charger is poor form. After 30 minutes of waiting, the car was at about 92% and I was close to attempting to disconnect, though I learned that that's not even possible with a Tesla. But then the owner came back. He was a lovely Finnish guy who was horrified he'd kept me waiting and informed me that the PlugShare app has a messaging feature that he had checked in and noted that he was nearby and would come back to disconnect if anyone needed the charger. So lesson learned and Tesla drove driver stereotype smashed. I stayed at that charger just long enough to get enough juice to get me to Gundagai because a full charge at 50 kilowatts is pretty painful to endure. The charge at Gundagai was fine and I eventually got home quite late. All up that day, the trip took at least four hours longer than it would have in a petrol car. This trip nearly had me swearing off EVs for future road trips. Other trips I did in the Polestar were recreational ones with my partner. We went to the mountains to go cross-country skiing for a couple of days. We didn't have any problems with massively reduced range in the sub-zero temperatures and just a small amount of stress waiting for the free NRMA charger in Jindabyne. During dinner, I had to keep running out of the restaurant to check if a spot was free yet and hope that when it did come up that I hadn't missed the spot to someone who happened to show up at the right time to snaffle it. We also did a trip to Sydney to see Niels from Prey at the Opera House, which was really cool. Um, I'd learned a few things about EV road trips by then. So to minimize the pain, my partner cleared space in the garage so we could fully charge at home before we left. And then I spent a while researching to find a hotel in Sydney we could charge at. But the hotel turned out to have only Tesla chargers and they were in a nearby public car park and had been iced with petrol cars parked in those spots anyway. Later in the evening, we went back and found a normal wall outlet we could plug into, but it didn't give us enough charge to get home, and we had to stop at a shopping mall charger the next morning before we went home. All up, in the roughly 3,000 kilometers I drove, time-wise, I spent a little over 10 hours at public charges, and dollars-wise, I spent $284.33. So let's compare that to an internal combustion car, and the Polestar 2 is based on the same platform as the Volvo XC40, so we can use that as a comparison. I spent $284 and in the XC40 at June petrol prices, I would have spent about $493. So that's a 40% saving in the Polestar. Pretty good. Time-wise, though, that's a lot more time spent charging than I would have spent at petrol stations. However, in the vast majority of cases, I was doing something I would have been doing anyway while I charged, whether that's food or a toilet break on the road trips or leaving the car charging while I went shopping with my mum, or in fact, recording the intro and outro to this YouTube video. The time spent charging ranged from no big deal at all, like on the first leg of my trip, through to an absolute nightmare that added more than 50% to the total trip duration on that Wagga experience. <laughs> So anyway, that's my EV road trip story. Before I spent these three weeks driving an EV, I had a really different idea about what needs to be done to accelerate the transition from internal combustion cars to EVs. I thought that battery technology still has a way to go, that we would need more range at a lower cost to address range anxiety. That would definitely be nice. For sure, the main thing that's stopping me buying an EV today is the cost. And I don't just mean the extra cost of a new EV compared to a new petrol car, because that's narrowing fast. And anyway, you get a lot more for your money with an EV in terms of like cheaper fuel costs, cheaper maintenance costs, and they're pretty much full of all the fancy electronics. They're just really nice cars. No, for me, a huge obstacle is that I've never bought a new car. I've never bought a car that was less than nine years old, in fact, and a nine-year-old electric vehicle is, to be honest, not that great if you want to do long trips in it. That's because nine years ago, EV technology was nowhere near where it was today. It's not that I think that today's EVs will be no good in nine years' time. This is probably a good time to point out again that the things that EVs do well they do amazingly well. Do you drive mostly locally and have somewhere to charge at night? Well, then there is nothing but EV upside for you. You'll never go to a petrol station again. (laughs) Likewise, if you do a lot of trips where you can get there and back on a single charge. One of the guys I talked to at a charger was living in, I think, Bendigo, and he had grandkids in Melbourne. So he could do a day trip on one charge, no worries. And again, never goes to petrol stations anymore and is loving it. But for people like me, and yeah, I do know that we are a very small minority of drivers, but those of us who do mostly long trips and maybe also to a lesser extent those who can't charge at home, say people who live in apartments. What we need isn't better cars or even more battery range, not really. 
What we need is better charging infrastructure. It needs to be reliable. And that means that there need to be enough of them so you don't get stuck waiting for hours. Right now, I'm parked like diagonally across two spots to try and get the car close enough to the charger because the there is a car taking up the spot near the charger that I need. They finished charging and could take the plug out, but the spot's full and that's just so annoying. It means that the chargers that do exist need to be working, um, including that the apps are working. How about a credit card payment option in case the app isn't working? Or, you know, if the mobile network is down or if your phone dies or something. And simply more chargers, please. If there were more chargers around, then if you came to a charger that was full, then you could probably make it to another one. I really feel like we need to get this sorted as a priority. Um, government support to help more people buy EVs. It's only going to exacerbate these issues if we don't tackle charging at the same time. And I do feel like it's hard to see how private companies on their own are going to be able to get this working smoothly in the near future. I don't think that with the current number of EV drivers, there's a compelling business case for anyone to invest heavily in this space and probably won't be for a few years yet. And I think the fact that so many charges are broken and the apps are struggling a bit too, I think that suggests that existing players are finding it hard to make enough money to maintain what they have, let alone expand in the way that we need to happen. So if we get the order wrong and support a lot more people to buy EVs without simultaneously taking care of all the charger issues, we're going to end up with big queues and very frustrated drivers. Oh, and that brings me to my final complaint. While we wait for all that to be sorted out, could someone please come up with a sort of queuing system? I mean, it's tolerable to wait, say, 30 minutes or longer for your spot in a queue to start charging if you can go do something in that time. But if you have to wait at your car, watching the car that is currently charging and make sure that you let anyone else know who comes along that you're next in the queue. I mean, I'm sorry, it just feels like a matter of time before we start seeing fisticuffs at public EV chargers. If there were an actual system on on the charger to add your number plate to an official queue, then I think that would be the best. Maybe you could also check the queue length ahead of time when you're looking for a charge location, but that's probably unrealistic. If everyone was using PlugShare or an alternative app that everyone used, then that could take care of it, but everyone isn't using the same app. The person who's taking up the parking spot that I should be in now, you know, they've, they've been gone for a while and they weren't on the PlugShare app, I did check. So in the absence of those better solutions, what about post-it notes on the charger itself? Can we start that as a thing? or if someone somewhere has solved this already then please tell me in the comments what the solution is thanks for watching this video i've tried to be honest without worrying too much about looking like you know like a really stupid newbie thanks for watching thanks as always to the engineering with rosie patreon community if you would like to join us and support the channel and join our patreon only discord server then you can join us at this link which i will put in the description i'll see you in the next video